One of the things that has baffled me over the years, anytime I'm in a, quote, prayer meeting mm -hmm. or a, quote, time of prayer, you know, two people, eight people, a church full of people, I just am baffled by how few people pray during those times or ask for prayer. Mm. Like we were, honestly, I'm going to out my team a little bit here. We were in a time of staff prayer a few weeks ago and I just kicked it open and said, where's the need? Like, what, what can we pray for? And it's just silence. And I know it's, you know, we're just getting started in the morning and there's all these other reasons. And this is a praying group of people, but there is, there is something in human nature that hits a speed bump. Mm. When we come to prayer, it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like, oh, it's just the next thing. I'm just, I was talking to you. Now I'm talking to yes. Jesus. You know, I was talking to Jesus. Now I'm talking to you. Like, there's some sort of hiccup. There's some sort of fence. There's right, almost like a reluctance to go there. Embarrassment, awkwardness. I don't really know. And I think it depends person to person. Yes. But I am so passionate about prayer because it works. Yes. People. And we need help. And the greatest help that we need is simply more of God. Yes. Like I, over the years, my my prayers have shifted from getting stuff done. Now, I still pray for a bunch of stuff to get done to I need you, God. Mm -hmm. Particularly, first thing, right? It's morning, evening. Like, I just, I just need God right now. And that's why I'm enjoying this series that we're doing here. Friends, welcome back. John and Morgan riffing here in the week of May 10th on the Wild at Heart podcast, we're actually wrapping up a three-part series here on contemplative prayer, centering prayer, prayer that is um, meant more to be experiential, taking in God yes. with your whole being rather than just kind of rattling off the quick list, my car, my dog, my work, thank you, Lord. Like This is meant to be much richer than that. And so if you didn't hear parts one and two, you might want to go back and grab those we're picking up with part three. Morgan and Sherry have been guiding us through some thoughts and some practices here. And I think you're going to dig it. John, I love what you're saying. And I had an experience several years ago where there was some breathing room in summer and I took three weeks to really focus on the daily prayer. Again, trying to recover the intimacy, the experiential reality of God in it. I slowed down and I asked myself this question, what is the fruit of praying the prayer in me? Not just the fruit of what it does in the world, which huh. is important, huh. but literally how do I feel in my whole person afterwards? And I realized there were different levels of the daily prayer. And the first is kind of getting things done, right? Bringing the kingdom, consecrating, yep. establishing authority, which is essential, but deeper, there's an experiential reality. I think it's captured best in a quote from Peterson where he said, prayer must first be about being and becoming before it can ever be about doing and getting. And in an efficient world, we charge the field with doing and getting when what God's after first and foremost is intimacy and increase of his presence in our life and therefore through our lives. And so friends, yeah, we're really excited to bring you into this Become Good Soil podcast that we're featuring here at Wild at Heart, where I had the privilege of hosting Sherry, who's done a lot of work in this category over the last decade. And so we want to dive in into not only some ideas on contemplative prayer, centering prayer, but actually a third experience in the practice of this sort of prayer. And so friends, welcome. Let's dive in. One of the things that is so important to keep at the forefront of our heart and our mind in this and in the Christian life is that we are always and forever in some ways, beginners, that yes, we are maturing. Yes, we're growing deep. Yes, we are going after the deeper things of transformation in the kingdom. But part of the posture of an apprentice that keeps us centered in the reality of what God is doing and what he is like and how he is doing it is a posture of student. Scriptures say that 
I will be your father and you will be my son. That when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so one of the realities of kind of a worldview that we are impressed to keep at the center of our heart and mind is that we are always and forever beginners. This third episode, we dive into this reality because the practices can get clunky and they can be challenging and there can be setbacks. And that's why it's called a practice. But our invitation to you as our friends is to um, start with kindness, start with um, a posture of knowing that God is bringing something that's different, that um, has a different way perhaps of relating to him and with him than we have consistently before. So with that, with a posture of kindness and accessibility, we want to take you into the third episode of a three-part series for Become Good Soil on contemplative prayer. Sherry, just by way of um, illustration, to to keep it really accessible in observing your life in our 17 years together, one area— of many that I've seen so much fruit born out of this practice, I would call it the practice of non-evaluation, where in our early years of marriage, often in a social environment, you would come home and spend an extraordinary amount of energy replaying the tape of how that experience was and how that conversation was, right? And I genuinely now over time see a pattern of you handling those experiences very differently. And it's not that it's not a temptation or even a struggle at times, but you simply do not have these depths of evaluation yes. where you are your greatest critic. Yes. Can you just kind of speak on that a little bit? Yes. Morgan, I so appreciate your question because it really does, I think, help flush out the particular fruit for me. So the metaphor I use personally to understand my internal experience of this is that I have within me this problem solver. And if I understand correctly, as it relates to the function of the brain, there's a part of the brain that functions with very fast waves. These fastest ones are the waves, they're the beta waves of the brain, and they represent our problem solver. And I need my problem solver. I need her. I need her to evaluate many, many things. This morning, we had some milk that we had taken camping and I'd left in our cooler for a couple days and the ice had been melting and I needed my evaluator to be able to take in the sensory experience of smelling that milk and decide if that milk is worthy of consumption or not. She's essential to me. But when my problem solver becomes overactive and she's constantly scanning the world and almost compulsively evaluating my worthiness of love and breath and life and belonging, someone else's worthiness of love and life and belonging, the quality of someone else's life and then comparing it to the quality of my life. From my experience, this practice of my problem solver simply isn't fruitful. And my overactive problem solver is really no longer working for me. And what is so gorgeous about practices of contemplation is that it moves us out of those fast waves of the brain, the beta waves, and moves us into some of the deeper, more gorgeous waves of the brain. There's the alpha waves and then the theta waves and then finally the delta waves that are the slowest waves. And again, if we use brain imaging techniques, we can see these different waves of the brain adjusting to how we're using our minds. And so when I drop down and use my mind in what we might call a more contemplative way, I'm not trying to solve any problems in reality. I'm simply basking and perceiving and reposing in God's universe, that it, it, it really does strengthen the parts of my physiology that can then cooperate with my spirit that wants to rest in God and wants to not try to solve things that really were never meant for me to even be thinking of in that way. I was spending time with someone who in the past I've been so tempted to evaluate my life my decisions in reference to hers and her life and her decisions and evaluate how she's raising her kids. 
and compare it to how I'm raising my kids and just be so busy in my head with all of this evaluation. And about halfway through our time together, I realized I, I just hadn't even, none of those thoughts had occurred to me. I, I was simply enjoying myself without evaluating. Mm. And it was, it was just, I just wanted to, to leap up in the air and give a shout of joy. I just never, ever thought, Morgan, that I could become the kind of person who could simply be present hmm. instead of problem solving. And I'm so grateful and I want more. Sherry, it's so good. I've, I've had the privilege of serving as a witness and over the years, and it's so hopeful to sit here and realize practical realization that people change. That, oh, that yes. the body can change, that our souls can change, that we can be integrated. Yes. We can be united with God in ever deeper measure. Yes. It is so hopeful. And as you said, it's very accessible. I mean, you, you have my attention, and I'm sure right now you have the attention of many of our friends near and far. And so there's nothing like the practical. Yes. Um, take us into, okay, I'm open. I, I want the fruit of what you are describing yes. in this series. So we will get to practicing. But in your personal life, yes. uh, how did you get started? How how do you practice? Yes. And I, I just want to say in compassion that our lives are very similar to our friends out there. You know, we, we live in a Western world and we are full and even over full and busyness and hurry sickness threatens us at every turn. Yes. And, and so we're not talking about becoming a nun. Right. And we're not talking about some other life or something that happens yes. far away from our daily reality, right? I just want to be honest with that. We're yes. talking about something that is available yes. to everyone yes. that we're speaking with. How do you do it? Well, let me just... For example, yesterday, I found myself just pausing for some time of, for lack of better words, we'll call it meditation or contemplation, contemplative prayer in my car next to a dumpster because I had 15 minutes and I wanted to pause. So I pulled over and parked, happened to be next to a dumpster and it just made me smile. So exactly, Morgan, it's, and I, I so in your, you're in your minivan yes. in the middle of suburbia yes. in between <laughs> errands and children yes. and work and your cell phone and yes. constant tax, yes. and you choose to pull over next to a dumpster and spend 15 minutes yes. practicing. Yes. yes. It's beautiful. <laughs> You're beautiful. It's something like that. I, I don't love know. everything about you. <laughs> oh, can I quote you on that? Mm -hmm. Oh, my. So, yeah, Morgan. Well, and, and this is really beautiful, and I, I um, have been so fortunate. I've had so many leaders and teachers who formed me. And there's, I would say, two primary ways that I practice this. And one is what I guess I just have been learning is classically called discursive meditation. And that's a meditation that intentionally engages my imagination, intentionally engages what you might call an imaginative, sensory, full person experience entering in, in this case for me, in my practice, primarily to a scene in a scripture, an encounter with Jesus, and feeling it. This is part of our um, lineage with Lectio Divina, the invitation to actually enter into a scene of scripture and feel temperature on our skin and taste bread in our mouths. And again, back to the brilliance of the intelligence of God and the provision of God, God's heart to provide for us in a world where our hearts and psyches would be broken, is that, again, if we were to use brain imaging technology, someone who is eating a piece of bread and drinking wine and really pausing to feel and to tune into the textures and the flavors and the nuances and subtleties of that experience, different parts of their brain would light up with activity. Similarly, someone who is simply deeply, profoundly focusing and imagining eating bread, drinking wine, the same places light up. We mm -hmm. can actually have these quote-unquote virtual experiences that, again, to the neuroplasticity, neurons that fire together, wire together. So though maybe it's been years since I've tasted pomegranate. I can imagine tasting pomegranate and feeling the little 
tiny explosion of the pomegranate seed and the juice in my mouth and the texture of the seed as if I were eating the pomegranate. My brain is firing and therefore wiring around that experience. So here has God made this possible for me, Sherry Snyder, in 2017 to enter into through my focused imagination to enter into first century Palestine, first century Jerusalem, and be with Jesus. So that is a way that I would call discursive meditation. That was what I practiced earlier this morning. I was entering into um, the scene where in Luke, where a woman comes and she is a woman, a sinful woman, quote unquote, who comes and anoints Jesus and ends up weeping over him and then kissing his feet, it says. And I was thinking to myself, who knows Jesus's feet? She knows them. She knows Mm. the texture of his skin against her lips. And if I just enter in and seek to feel the warmth of his feet or the coolness of his feet or the texture of his feet as I press my lips against him, oh my goodness, that's such a sensory experience. And that is wiring my brain around the accessibility and the gorgeousness of Christ. The other way that I practice this is in what you might call the more of the vein of centering prayer is Thomas Keating's word for it. I think that Teresa of Avila called it something like the prayer of silence. So it is a prayer that really has more to do with not actively engaging the meditation, but in simply reposing or resting in the presence of God, in a realization of the presence of God that's always with us. But perhaps in different moments in my day, I'm not yet practiced to be tuned into it and to be resting in it at all times. And so it's the intention to sit and rest and simply in all of my, everything I am and everything I'm not, make contact, direct realization with the presence of God that is completely present to me. Again, part of the scandal of the gospel is that the divine, the creator, is Trinitarian and would completely Um, in all vulnerability and in all wholeness of heart. Settle on me and on you, Morgan, and on every member of the human race as the object of his love and as the desire to include us in unending life, the vibrancy of God. And so oftentimes this is done through, as a way of staying present, is through using some sort of perhaps a single phrase or a single word that we repeat silently within our own hearts and minds to help us stay grounded in the present moment. And um, I have more to say on that, but those are my two primary practices. One is what I would call centering prayer, and the other is what uh, classically is called discursive meditation, or maybe we could call it a variation of Lectio Divina. Sherry, as you describe just the practicality of beginning One of the things I'm aware of in my own practice of this discipline, this activity, is all sorts of things come up, right? You 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 set yourself before God and you start imagining, or you as you said, you you start the centering prayer of just simply being with him. And one of the things I've experienced consistently is, oh my goodness, there's an internal world of care chaos that surfaces all kinds of thoughts from what I'm going to eat for lunch to something I screwed up to what I ought to be doing with my time or, or, you know, checking our bank statement on the internet. Oh gosh. Right. So when I hear you describing it, it sounds hopeful, but also unattainable if I'm not honest with how messy it is. So what comes up and how might we deal with that? Yes. I just love it, Morgan. Oh, I can so relate. One of our teachers, Thomas Keating, really encouraged us not to evaluate each session of centering prayer, for example, not to give it a grade. Because, oh my goodness, sometimes I sit down, like you said, for this practice. And I mean, seriously, I'm just, all I want to do is work on my budget, balance this, balance that. Oh my gosh, I should go and check this email about this curriculum day at the school. Or I mean, it's just wild, wildness. And Morgan, this is where I just think it's it's like this divine setup in even the simple act of contemplative prayer for the exercise of compassion. You know, in Psalm 103, it says, He remembers our frame. He knows that we are made of dust, and He has compassion on us as a father, would have compassion on His children. 
ironically, that word compassion in the Hebrew is extremely visceral. It's uh, related to the word for womb, that the tender cherishing of the womb of a mother, the very visceral language. And so to practice compassion on ourselves, non-judgment, non-evaluation, attaching no relative value to whether our minds are quiet or whether our minds are racing is part of the subtlety of the practice. We actually end up growing our compassion muscle Mm. right along with quieting our nervous systems. It's just gorgeous. So Sherry, in that, what what I hear you saying is one of the invitations of the gospel is rather than to chase everything with the evaluator in the sense of we are the judger of our lives, because of God's grace, because the reality of his generosity and his constant intervention, we actually can pause and simply just observe that. We can observe to go, wow, okay, there are a lot of other thoughts going on in my mind. Yes. And that's okay. That's just a data point where I'm not being uncritical of it. I go, okay, there are a lot of thoughts in my mind, and now I acknowledge it, and now I release it. Yes. Yes. And sometimes I spend my whole, you know, 15 to 20 to 25 minutes, my my uh, evaluator, she never seems to run out of steam. <laughs> and um, that's a legitimate practice as well. Mm. That's to be honored and valued. Yes. Friends, by way of practice, we'll turn a corner here in this final episode, reminding ourselves that it is always and ever practice. That it's not something that we come and sort of with this idealized self attempt to perform something. But we come in a spirit of practice, of curiosity, of inquiry and exploration. As if we were standing at the beginning of a trailhead, heading into an unexplored canyon. And all of our senses are acute and turned on, excited, but without pressure, without expectation, simply ready to show up and experience whatever we encounter. This final meditation I want to offer in the spirit of something that's become very precious to me in our inheritance of the Christian contemplative practices. It is this concept of the beginner's mind. Dallas Willard says in the opening of The Divine Conspiracy, He is speaking of our familiarity with Christ. And he says that in time, it sometimes comes to pass that familiarity can give way to presumed familiarity. That presumed familiarity can then give way to unfamiliarity. And these now, in my words, that that unfamiliarity can give way to boredom, obscurity, or even contempt. And that within the kingdom, there is this tremendous antidote for the slippery slope of familiarity giving way to presumed familiarity, giving way to unfamiliarity. I see this in my own marriage. When I presume that I know Morgan, when I relate to him as a static being, when I objectify him into these categories that are static and stiff, I lose the power and intrigue and endlessly curious experience of being in dynamic relationship with him. I lose out on the moment-to-moment subjective realization of connecting with him. Is it perhaps that this was part of Jesus' warning throughout the Gospels when he says things that are so sometimes strange and startling as if to wake us up, perhaps in case any presumed familiarity were encroaching upon our moment-to-moment contact with the living God? The contemplatives call this antidote the beginner's mind, that we approach contemplation as if for the first time again and again and again, lest it become something rote, boring, disinteresting, and obscure. We come with a beginner's mind. 
three times in the New Testament, we um, hear the gospel writers recording Jesus, describing that it is those who will receive the kingdom like a little child who will be able to enter into its substance. I see that the contemplative practice is one of the ways of being transformed, coming to the kingdom, divesting myself of that which I have presumed to know, that I might become like a little child, unlearning where I have learned the Trinity wrong, where I have learned reality wrong, and learning as if for the first time, God in Christ all over again. So for this practice, we will practice the joy of coming into the unconditional love of God from a practice of childlike trust and awareness, cherishing the safeguard of a beginner's mind that will protect us from presumed familiarity leading to unfamiliarity, leading to boredom, disinterest, obscurity, or contempt. So friends, I invite you to just find a place that would feel um, good and conducive for you for just the set-aside time of contemplation and meditation. Once again, connecting with the breath, observing that inhale, as if it were the first conscious breath you had ever taken, as if it were something completely novel to have lungs that breathe. On the inhale, feeling the ribs expand on the front side of the body, feeling the chest wall crest with breath. Reaching the tippy top of your breath, and then as if like a child cresting the top of a hill, Find the back side of the breath as if you were coasting down a hill on your bicycle. Unfettered and free. On the next inhale, allow the breath to rise again as with an energy all its own, as with an exuberance, as if glad to be alive in God's universe, perhaps with a gladness unfamiliar to you in your conscious mind, but with some deep knowing of the goodness of God beyond what you might know by word or concept, allowing the glad breath to fill, exhaling, letting the breath to ebb away, assured that there will be more There will always be more food for you, always more filling for you. With childlike trust, take the next inhale. Perhaps in the eye of your heart, you call to mind the very face of your brother Jesus. And you see him beckoning to you. Observe the age of Jesus in this encounter. What is his age as he calls to you? And then observe your own age. What age? Perhaps it is the age of some timeless childlike place in you that is responding to the beckoning of your brother Jesus. Allow that part of you to show up with gladness and with trust. Perhaps you imagine your brother Jesus beckoning you. He's beckoning you. He's beckoning you. And you see and observe the joy and gladness and holy mischief on his face, as if there is some great goodness of which he is assured. And you find in your own face a response deeper than words, deeper than consciousness of gladness to be beckoned. Observe how you respond to Jesus. And then imagine it was irresistible, his beckoning, that the joy and energy of his countenance, of his being, was irresistible to you. And you found yourself responding 
with childlike trust that there was a goodness for you, an inclusion for you in the life of God. And you realize that Jesus is beckoning you to the Father. He's beckoning you to the Father. And he is beckoning you to the care and the mothering of the Spirit. And he is beckoning to a home that is home to you, of which every home you have ever known has been a breath and expression. And you find yourself accompanying Jesus into the very heart of the triune God, where there is place and space reserved for you. And friends, imagine that you were able to come with every question you have, with every need of your heart, with every question, am I loved? Do I have secure belonging? Is my past enough to secure the present and future of which I dream? God, are you really deeply, comprehensively good? Is there food for me? And for all those I care about, is there the renewal of the whole earth as I hope that you have promised? Is it true, God? Are you really good? And every question of your childlike soul, every question you have accumulated over your decades on the earth is welcomed and met. And every need you have for validation to the very depths of your being for legitimacy in the household of God is met and there is a gladness of homecoming and a sensory experience of acceptance and secure belonging and love and knowing and the giving and receiving of love and energy. Oh God, we ask for the grace to practice receiving your kingdom like a little child in utter dependence, bearing the deep needs of our soul for validation, for secure belonging, for affection and intimacy, for play and humor, for shared adventure and intimacy and beauty. We come bearing all of our need, all of our hunger, God and child-like trust that for that which we hunger, there is provision. In Trinitarian reality, both now and forevermore. Friends, I encourage you to just pause, to inhale and exhale in the present love of the Trinity for you and your inclusion in the family of God, in your place and space, safe in God's great universe, in the very heart of God. I invite you to linger for as long as you are able, finding rest and repose, practicing childlike trust, though it might seem as if it's the most foreign practice to your soul that often feels ragged and cynical, given the pain and disappointment of your life. We affirm the raggedness and we practice the childlike trust. Thank you, God, for this time. Send forth your spirit to our friends, to every heart that is listening, God, and to mine as well. Deepen our capacity to receive your kingdom as a child, to bring all of our hunger and all of our unavoidable need to your great heart and being and to the family of God. Friends, to close this time, consider just a few deep inhales and exhales. And if it would feel interesting to you or available to you, consider drawing your arms out to the side wherever you are on a deep inhale. And then on an exhale, On behalf of the God who loves you and the incarnate one who pursues you, consider wrapping your arms around yourself, clasping opposite shoulder, each one of your hands, and closing 
this time in a hug, settling the nervous system as we exhale and just squeeze. Inhale, consider bringing one hand to the heart and one hand to the belly. Exhale, and on behalf of the Christ who loves you, blessing your deep heart with all of his or her questions and your deep belly with all of his or her need. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, I hope that this has been meaningful for you. For many of us, it's a new way of getting into prayer. And in a busy world, in a hurried world, we need this. I just far too often, prayer is something I cram into my day because I need it and there's stuff that needs God, but to breathe stop, find God as part of your overall prayer experience. And and there's times to throw down, gang. (laughs) There's times the quick little Jesus prayers in the car. Yep, absolutely. Help me, Lord. Amen. But to add to your quiver in your prayer experience, this form of, of reflective, slow down, enter in. I hope this has been really helpful for you. Morgan, Thanks for bringing this to us. Love what God's been doing in your prayer life and Sherry's over the years. Really rich. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's our passion to take people deep and to offer what we are receiving. And so we're proud of you. We're proud of you for taking a risk. The kingdom of God growing in us and enlarging is always synonymous with risk. And so if you're enjoying this, the spirit of it was to feature some of the deeper dive content that exists in Become Good Soil, which is a deep discipleship track of Wild at Heart. And as always, we love joining you to come into your world every week. It's a privilege and an honor to share this space with you. Yeah, it really is. Have a great week, friends. 